Africa. Good evening to you, listeners of Voice of Africa Radio. Today, the 16th of March 2015, I am in the studio with Brian Sturgis, the editor, the managing editor of World Economist, is in the studio with me this evening to talk about this important issue, talking about the foreign aid and its repercussion on the African continent. I have Mahmoud Faiz, Liberal Democrat, Latin and Wanted, a human rights activist, and also an expert in South Asian politics. Elizabeth Rock Jones, Liberal, a uh, UK. <laughs> Dartford parliamentary candidate and also deputy chairwoman Sadak also with me in the studio. We will be soon joined by Lembed Opec to also join in the discussion this evening to talk about this important issue. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me on Voice of Africa Radio and you are welcome. And you, thank you very much. Yes, uh, foreign aid as Donald Reagan once said, it is carrot and stick approach to dealing with some nations. Uh, let's look at Africa, for instance, example of Rwanda and uh, um, Rwanda and Ethiopia. Rwanda, Britain has stopped giving Rwanda any aid at all for supporting, allegedly supporting M23. And Uganda is, uh, sorry, uh, Ethiopia is getting most of British foreign aid now because uh, they are also listening to Great Britain and whatever Britain will propose to them. The aid is also being used allegedly to evict land owners, to giving it to foreign investors in uh to give it to foreign investors to invest in that country. Is aid helping African continent at all? Is aid doing what the donors are saying uh, it should be doing on the continent of Africa? Brian? I think first what we've got to do is um, <coughs> stop seeing aid as one name for a no- what, what not, it actually represents an enormous range of um, different forms of money with different forms of ties and so on I mean aid initially certainly did work in Europe uh, after the Second World War but aid can be tied it can be actually uh, humanitarian, it can actually be go straight to a government it can actually be delayed in terms of its um, the, the, the time meaning that if you rely on it for a project sometimes you don't get it uh, but certainly at the top level, there is no evidence that aid has actually helped African GDP growth. Um, and actually, quite the reverse. Most of the top level studies show that uh, those countries who have received most aid sometimes have had slower rates of economic growth. And unfortunately, also, uh, it's not just the money which just goes into Africa, it's the money which comes out of it. And certainly, I think a study I saw by the African Development Bank was a single over the last few decades, $1.4 trillion has come out of the African continent. Um, Now, some of that's come from aid, some of it's come from uh, exploitation of resources. The big problem is if you give give aid um, when the institutions aren't reformed, you're just um, wasting it. And of course, there was a demise of um, my argument that all aid is completely wrong. I wouldn't say all is wrong. I would just say it's got to be very, very carefully. Well, uh, UK has stated that they are not in support of all aid, as he said, but humanitarian aid, UK is well out. If they are given the nod or given the chance to represent the people of Great Britain. They will make sure that some humanitarian aid will they be given to some countries which are indeed in need of it. Elizabeth. Yes, Adam. Your policy on aid and how aid is encouraging or how aid is destroying the continent of Africa. Our policy on foreign aid is that we totally reject the government government proposal that 0.7 of the gross national income should be ring-fenced for foreign aid. At the moment, as you can appreciate, that's a fluctuating figure, depending each year what our gross national income is. This year, it's been about £11 So this year, we've paid out about £11 billion in foreign aid. And uh, the Liberal Democrat MP, Michael Moore, has in fact put through... uh, 
uh, private members bill, the International Development Bill, which has passed its third reading, whereby he is seeking to make it law to ring fence 0.7% of our GNI for foreign aid. So that means seven pence out of every ten pounds of taxpayers' money is going to go to foreign aid. We say this is a, it's a scandal. That, that, that money outrageous? will go into the, uh, those countries that we give it to them, and we'll get more out of those countries. So it, it, wouldn't it be great if Great Britain would give uh, uh, 11 billion to countries like uh, Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, Uganda, and earn more money out of those economies? Is it not great? Uh, well, in an ideal world, yes, it would be great, but there's no guarantee whatsoever that, in fact, is going to happen. As we are aware, uh, foreign aid is subject to uh, extreme fraud. We have the president of Zaire managed to trouser 5 billion US dollars. We have President Abacha of Nigeria trousered 5 billion uh, US dollars. Uh, we have the uh, Department of International Development ha- employing vast numbers of consultants. They're employing people like Price Waterhouse Cooper in order to do their work. They say that they can't do it now because they've had cutbacks. And in fact, in 2012, they spent £4 million with PwC, a large consultancy firm. It seems to me that this is creating very nice careers, very nice jobs, uh, a whole industry of poverty uh, without really getting to the root of what is happening in these countries. I follow Demisa Moyo, the Zambian economist. She says that, in fact, aid creates a culture of dependency, poverty and corruption. It also severs the democratic link between the African leader and the electorate, because the African leader knows that he never has to rely on the African electorate to supply him with any tax revenue. He can just put his hand out to the International Aid Agency. So we say no, it's fostering and corruption. Well, I'll come back to you, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you for coming and uh, joining us, Limbido Peck. Before we go to Mahmoud Faiz, uh, aid, as we all know, uh, we give it to countries and we determine the destiny of the country for them, whether we like it or not. Uh, point in references was when Tony Blair was in office, uh, 10 million uh, was proposed for Ghana. And the outcome of it was to get the whole Ashanti regional water supply to a British company that will not do anything but to supply water and take money. Uh, Courtesy, some non-governmental organizations in Ghana protested fiercely for their aid money to be rejected by Ghana. And still Ghana is controlling the supply of the water. What... Is your opinion on aid given to some of the African countries which cotos to the international pressure and neglect the responsibility of its governance towards its people? The simple answer, and I explain it, is that I think aid is absolutely essential, not least because it's some of the compensation that the West, particularly France, Holland, arguably America, and certainly Britain, should pay to countries which it ruined through its colonial processes to an extent. Let me explain my thinking. I worked in Nigeria for a while and I found it a very interesting place and yet it has more resources, more people, more land than the UK but it's dirt poor and my argument is because colonialism created an environment where Nigeria ended up as a broken state. But colonialism ended over uh, half a century ago, so why should that be an an, an excuse because for a country to steal? Yeah, simply because it takes it took hundreds of years to create the effects that we did, not all of which are bad, and it'll take decades at least, and maybe longer, to put things right. Now, where does aid fit into this? Um, I think that Elizabeth is right. Sometimes it doesn't work. There's a degree of corruption in every situation, including in British politics, as anybody who watches the news regularly can see. That, on its own, is not enough of a reason to give up on the idea of investing in countries to bring them up to our standard. People complain about immigration in this country. They wouldn't, many of them wouldn't come here if there wasn't an economic reason for doing but that. But don't you think that it is the aid as a result of aid to certain governments that is creating that environment in some part of Africa yes. for people to leave? Yes, we can all... To see well, greener pasture in countries it, like uh, America, I, Britain and Holland. I'm not sure if that is necessary, necessarily causing people to leave. But if you were to ask me does aid have a corrupting effect in places? Definitely so, and I don't question the examples which Elizabeth gave, but there are other times when it has done a great deal of good. If you look at a very simple and immediate case, the devastating cyclone which has just hit some islands, uh, which 
So in some situations we all agree that aid is acceptable. So we're not everybody in this room agrees that aid is sometimes acceptable. So we're not arguing about whether aid can be good. We're asking when it's good. Sometimes it's bad. And I would simply conclude at this point by saying what we haven't got is proper checks and balances. We haven't got proper accountability. That's where it goes wrong. But aid on its own inherently isn't a bad thing because we're we're paying for some of the benefits we got by exploiting those countries in the first place. Is guilty. It's like Germany, like you know, Greece saying, "Well, Germany's got to pay for reparations." <laughs> Greece is in debt. <laughs> uh, colonialism is a very, very complicated situation. Certainly, if you look at Nigeria, it wasn't over hundreds of years; it was just decades. We're talking about from the eighteen um, seventies, eighties um, until until the nineties when it was formed. It wasn't this long exploitation by Europeans. Um, slavery was actually. But Brian, do we do we <coughs> blame the wars of Africa on uh, slavery and colonization? After Africa, we ended these two things, and I mean, Africa it attained it. its independence. The, the only thing I think you can blame the Europeans for, um, which you can also blame very much, uh, European colonization of, of North America and Canada is the ignoring of ethnic or other boundaries and using straight lines to draw maps. Now, as Europeans, we um, we don't have much success with that ourselves. You know, if you think about most of the Second World War was because of Germans who were outside of national boundaries. We have the problem in Ukraine now. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, pro- it's a problem, but we can't just blame colonialism on it anymore. I'm not just playing. What? Just to clarify, I don't, I don't know who does come in. I'm not blaming colonialism alone. I'm saying we have a responsibility, but let's be completely cynical about this. Even if you have no moral interest in, if you like, the history of how things occurred, it's in our vested interest to have a peaceful continent. And that yeah, costs but, money. But the vested interest of the West or the developed world is to give money to rooks in administration just to uh, advocate for their clientele to get the asset that they've given out. That's for instance, Britain wouldn't give money to uh, Ethiopia just to for the love of Ethiopians, but they want the British uh, establishment to be in Ethiopia to get the best out of the Ethiopians. I, I agree, and if you move on to discussing how aid is done, I've got a lot to say about that. But the principle of aid, in my view, is a valid one. I just think that if we if we want to have less violence, less division, if we actually want to have less immigration away from uh, bad countries economically to good countries economically, then we kind of have to make a long-term investment. It's like a mortgage, and it takes a long time to pay a mortgage back. Well, Mahmoud, uh, aid to Africa, the consequences of the aid and how we see it in our own country that why should I pay my, my taxes and you will be taken to a country like Nigeria. Britain is going to give 600 million, uh, 60, 600 million to Nigeria just to make it uh, social services for British companies to go in and make sure that they can supervise it and take... Adam, good evening to you and your listeners. Um, Obviously, what you've done here is picked a few case works, and obviously you can't look at the individual case. We have to look at the principle of aid. And partly agree with my three uh, uh, colleagues here as well. I mean, they are right in every way. Uh, but I'm a Liberal Democrat. Uh, Elizabeth has actually, in a way, has said what I was going to say, but in a different way. She has said out of every £10, 7 pence is going to aid. I'll tell you what, 62,000 children in Africa were dying under five due to malnutrition. Now it's 42,000. Who is to be blamed? Sorry, hold on, hold on a moment. Don't you think that if we don't give uh, aid to Africa, the African would think, they would think to see to it that uh, the children should be looked after by using their own natural resources. Please allow me to finish. Africa Africa has had some natural disasters as well. Uh, But I'm going to get on to what you're saying anyway, if you allow me to finish. Now it's 42,000. So... Ten pound or seven pence, to be honest, is 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 what politicians are going to use to batter and barter and just make an election issue. It's our 
I will ask every lecturer listen to this. If I if somebody took seven pence out of your ten pound, you're not going to starve tomorrow. You still pay your mortgage payments. You still be paid it. But somebody across the continent will will live, have a life. Let me get you another figure for you. But Eight. Mahmoud, uh, if Eight. you take my seven pence out of my ten pounds and give it to a genuine person who well, would invest well, I, I will, that money properly, I will explain that if you allow me. I will, and will not establish an in, uh, Adam. Uh, Adam, uh, I will, in, I will, in, I will in, explain that. It's, it's given a destructive mechanism in their own country to uh, help the acronyms to make money, then I'll be happy. Absolutely. So would every British pundit country be. But we'll get on to that and explain it. Just want to get to another stage. One in five child will lose a parent due to AIDS in Africa. If my ten, seven pence in ten pound can help that, so be it, because I'll still be able to pay a mortgage, I'll still be able to Now, for what the questions you put forward, you're absolutely right. What happened previously was the aid was used as barter. You mentioned Tony Blair. Now, come on. I'm no friend of Tony Blair, and I hope that Tony Blair is no friend of mine. Yeah? And we'll leave it at that, because anything else I'll say over the airways will, will, should really be cut off. Uh, so you can see the way it used to work. Th- then... So what happened, it was going directly into government and it was being lost. So what the government has been doing is looking at agencies that do directly work within that and chat places and that can have a direct effect. Therefore, it doesn't have to pass through so many loopholes and then disappear. That's had some, that's had some positive effect. I've well, used the Brian, model of uh, Morris uh, We give, uh, America gave money, uh, aid to uh, Egypt to end corruption. But it ended up getting to the sons of Hosni Mubarak, the richest man in Syria, uh, Anuf, is a brother to uh, Assad, which of course, every investment in that country, that man has a hand in it, as a result of aid that we give to them. Recently in Ghana, the politicians and their family are making a lot of money because of the aid given them. They are all contracts or any investment that comes into that country, their hands in it is in it. Why do we? We have agencies on the ground who they know that these things are happening, but why are we still giving these people this money to corrupt their own society and punish the citizens of the country for our interest? I mean, I would say if you take the Mubarak, United States was not giving money to um, Egypt to prevent corruption, it was given each money to each of a matter of foreign policy to keep it on side, you know, yeah. away yeah. from... Um, but but it, yeah. it was one of the so basics for giving that money to... It's actually cheap foreign policy. Yeah. Um, but it's actually foreign policy which isn't very transparent. I mean, what I object to is, um, again, I've got no objection to humanitarian aid whatsoever. Uh, I do have objections to the idea that, I agree with Elizabeth here, that some percent, some arbitrary percentage is used, so that money is, can be taken out of our pockets or ring fenced, as opposed to, to being part of a general political debate about where our money is spent. Uh, if it's foreign policy, then it should be declared as foreign policy. I mean, the best thing you can actually do, to be honest, is not aid, but um, trade finance. Mm. Actually, helping. There's a huge problem in, in, in international trade between Africa and. and Externally, and between Africa itself, very little. It's extremely difficult to trade in Africa, and as those trade barriers came down, or companies were able to African companies were able to actually guarantee low cost loans for trade finance, and the banks are pulling more and more away from trade finance for all sorts of political or various reasons. That would have a huge impact. I tend to agree with what you've just said. And the reason I say this, and I'm not really completely opposed to what Elizabeth said, because I think the implementation of it has been diabolical, really, as you've just rightly pointed out. We buy our friends, really, and we try to have spheres of influence. This has gone, this goes right back, certainly to the beginning of the Cold War, probably long before then. And that's where it goes wrong. But the good news is, when Elizabeth is the foreign secretary, <laughs> she will make absolutely sure that the aid is administered properly. So the implementation <laughs> there, there problem goes away. There, there, no, there will be because because there will be. Uh, yeah. There will be. There certainly. Oh, yeah. Uh, there certainly will be foreign aid because the UKIP policy is that one billion 
will be ring fenced for humanitarian aid. As, as Brian says here, he doesn't oppose, I don't think any of us here would have ever oppose humanitarian aid. When there's a, an international crisis, earthquake, um, and we've had the Ebola crisis, of course we would um, give a helping hand. Of course, what we object to is, um, or is I'll just break down aid. For The first tranche of aid is bilateral aid, that's government to government. And in 2013, the British government paid £338 million pounds to Pakistan, £329 million to Ethiopia, then £269 to, uh, million 329 to, to Ethiopia just to evict the, uh, their mm-hmm. own citizens of their land mm-hmm. to give it to the uh, international organizations that are coming into Ethiopia. Right, so that's... And we that's cut that off uh, yeah, well, Rwanda. That's, that, that, that's the bilateral, that's government to government. <laughs> that's where it often ends up in people's Swiss bank accounts. The second one is multilateral aid, whereby we pay money direct, uh, what, to a third party, such as the World Bank, the UN, and the IMF. Now, there are considerable problems, I would say, with giving money to the IMF. As you're aware, with multilateral aid, that's subject to what we call conditionality. Yes. And the IMF is not going to give you money without conditions. And uh, one of the main conditions and concerns has been that the IMF has been imposing austerity and demanding the privatisation of key public services in the countries it gives aid to, which is called a structural adjustment, which I'm sure must really handcuff a, a country's economic development. I think Brian will take us through it. Uh, the structural adjustment programme of the IMF, the austerity, yeah. before we saw the austerity in Europe, uh, from 1980s onward, uh, they've implemented about four, four structure adjustment yeah. programs, economic reform programs in Africa. Witness that of structure adjustment program one, structure adjustment program two, structure adjustment program three, which is the PAMS card. And the latest one that was implemented in 2000 was highly indebted poor countries, yeah. HIPIC. You declare yourself a highly indebted poor nation and they will write off your debt. By in four years, you will be owing more than what you were. Well, so, exactly. I mean, one of the, one of the big problem was uh, was that the, the countries, the debt was just to expand and expand. There's no way that you, you can actually repay it off. <laughs> I mean, almost like Greece now, it's, mm. it's impo- there's going to be a default, there's going to be a haircut at some point. But let's look at the conditionalities attached to some of these economic uh, it, uh, programs to Africa. Is it humane conditionalities that you shouldn't subsidize education, mm-hmm. you shouldn't subsidize agriculture, no subsidy for health and yeah. transport? How can you develop and without all these things? Uh, expenditure cuts to, to move to uh, um, a surplus and so on. I mean, the, I agree, it's... it's by the time that the debt levels have got that high, obviously by the time the IMF is in, the IMF has to impose these these conditionalities. It's best that the IMF isn't in, isn't involved. I'd like to make out one point though that um, that we're talking about the, the system of aid, then how the money gets transferred back. I have to say that France has has worked it out to a T. Effectively, France gets involved with bilateral aid to a lot of uh, North African countries. But at the same time, it um, it imposes the central bank zone. So you have a you have a, a, a common currency of which the countries have to deposit with the Bank of France. Uh, and now, obviously, there's a little account with the ECB. Their reserves with a, a, non, a very, very low rate of interest. I mean, obviously, this is all interest rates are low now. But the current currency actually does help capital flows out of Africa into Switzerland, France, and so on. So the, um, the it's not just Britain doing bilateral. It, there's lots of European countries doing it, especially um, old colonial powers who do have uh, relationships with the, with these governments. And again, I'm not I'm not saying it's a problem of colonialism. It's just a problem that obviously there were. There were, there, were, there, were, there were ties there, but bilateral uh, condition aid is not aid. It's, 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 
it's, it's just foreign policy. Well, I mean, moment. Yeah, um, I think we're talking about two different things here. We're just a, just generalising it, but I just want to throw figure, two figures out uh, for your but listeners. But we've all listeners. agreed that when it comes to disaster <laughs> and how to help any country that well, has been affected, well, I will affected explain that because I'm actually involved with the charity we all and support that. projects. Mm-hmm. That. But when it comes to uh, giving aid to a country based on your foreign policy. But not based I on think that's, humanitarian. That's where the coming here. Let me let me try to explain to you. I just want to throw two figures out for a moment, yeah. And this is for your uh, listener to think about. First of all, uh, we talked about debt. Well, the debt of America is eighteen trillion dollars today was declared, which is just about the GPD of of, of whole of America. So now even the, one of the biggest economies in the world is actually in debt now. So it but looks like the whole world is in debt. Right. Let, me, let me let me just right. I realize that, but I just thought I'd throw that out to you to sort of uh, think about. And I think we're we're talking about two different things. I agree with the, a lot of the things that the professor is saying is is, is all right. That that has been the problem, but they are being solved. Uh, the other thing. It's never Elizabeth, resolved. No, no, let me, let me say, what Elizabeth has said about natural disasters, you can give £1 billion. Pound, well, that is, it's got me confused because we, the Liberty are saying, look, zero, seven pence out of your £10, we will put foreign aid. But they're actually ring fencing £1 billion. Pound. Why ring fence something? Yeah? And let me tell you another thing. I'm actually involved in a day to day running of charity, and I'm directly involved with a charity that where there was an earthquake in Kashmir. Now, on a practical sense, yeah, so there's an earthquake, yeah? The house falls down, the school falls down, the municipal offices fall down. You can't just go in, give aid, and then walk out because you still need the school, you still need the infrastructure. So what, you still do need you do? So what you need is an aid in the first of getting people shelter, getting people food, then building the infrastructure. Yeah, we so agree, that. So we so agree on right. that. We, we, that's, that what, that's what we're talking Britain about. Britain can give you any the, the, amount of money because you just are going there to put the resources together. Adam, let to me, let me explain. Is just going in. Yeah. And sort of saying, oh, we could give that and then wash hands and come out. That does not work. That just leaves people. And that's, that's, and, and that, also, that and, also and also, yeah. what it is, two, and another figure that uh, we mentioned about, you mentioned about Egypt. Israel gets the most aid from America. Do you know what the second country is? Egypt. So yeah, this is do with foreign policy. Never mix the two yeah, up. That's yeah? why we are saying that. Has it helped the continent of Africa to take eight people it's, from it's, the poverty? Our proven exactly it's, saved it's lives. Not, it's directly now, saved uh, lives. W- when we talk about that, Elizabeth. Yeah, can I ju- just... Um, I certainly would not disagree with any of the great African economists that I previously quoted. Uh, in fact, Demisa Moyo, the legendary Zambian economist, said in her book, Dead Aid, that uh, from the early 1940s, Forties, Africa has had one trillion US dollars in aid, and yet Africa's per capita, uh, per capita income is lower now than it was in the 1970s. She says it's been poorer ever yeah, since. Yeah, she says from that it has not benefited from aid at all, not at all. In fact, the World Bank did a survey, and it discovered that 85 percent of aid income never reached the um, target it was meant meant for. Uh, Demisa de Boyer's view is that in fact. Africa's economy needs to become independent, and the way forward is to issue bonds to hold the African countries to account. And, and also even the issuance of bonds, there is certain uh, uh, conditionalities mm-hmm. or what uh, they do. Their negotiations is very poor. All oh, right, okay. uh, Ghana issued bond. Yes, it went very quick, and it was oversubscribed because it was poorly done. Rwanda did the same thing. It went quick, and it was oversubscribed because. It wasn't done properly. No, no good negotiators, no good economists, no good people to but do you, that job for them. Yeah. So why the yields, hmm? the yields offered were too high? They're very, very yes. So how but, can but you? She also, <laughs> she also says that she also says there must be further encouragement of foreign direct investment into Africa with joint ve- joint business ventures. So that's how she say, sees the way forward. Well, let me, let's let's uh, look at the uh, multinational organisations, uh, the uh, IMF and World Bank, yeah. which obviously. We all know they work for uh, America and its allies. The World Bank programs and the IMF programs are always not in favor of the recipient, the African continent. And then uh, World Trade Organization, some of its trade agreement with Africa would forever encourage Africa to go cap in hand begging because it hasn't given Africa the right to trade fairly with the rest of the world. So with all this, how can Africa... And the money that we pump into Africa, how can it 
transform the lives of its people. Well, it could happen if we had a different motivation. But we've been talking about this word conditionality. I think all of us mentioned it, Brian certainly has. Conditionality, in my view, I, I wrote, let me take a step back. I wrote a piece of research called Rewriting the African Script when I worked partly with the um, Nigerian government about three, four years ago. And I realised that really the script for Af Africa has been written for the convenience of, the, of Western countries. And so therefore self-interest really is at the heart of this whole aid um, agenda for governments. I think that there are genuine people who are trying to implement the aid and who campaign uh, favourably for African communities. But really, as I think Brian said, it's a foreign policy tool. Now, what does that mean? Well, we're not really going to make any proper progress if all we're asking each time is does this help or harm, say, Britain in the short term? And a lot of it's short-term thinking. And you know the biggest, one of the biggest investors now? It's China. China is stepping in and buying, essentially buying up great influence in Africa. Resources. They, they've got, yeah, they've resources. got resources. They've got I mean, you know, half a billion people there. That's a resource. Mm. Massive land. Sunlight could become a big resource, depending on what happens to But what production. China is doing is they don't just give you the money, but they develop the infrastructure for you to see that this is the infrastructure we put in there. So what is your, what are you giving us? When I worked in Guangzhou uh, for, funny enough, an American multinational, I was immensely impressed with the integrity of the relationship that you could have with Chinese business people. They were reliable, and they've got a very clear agenda for China. It's not an accident that China will be the biggest economy in the world, I would say, within 20 years. Now, what they're doing is they're using aid, once again, in terms of the self-interest of China, but they're using aid in a way which is slightly less careless. What conditionality means to me in the conversation we're having is imposing a capitalist dogma, uh, because that's what is the fashion at the moment in the West. China has a different agenda, different philosophy, and it seems to sit a bit more comfortably. Now, I'm not an expert. I think Brian can again say for me, and I won't, I won't compete if, if Brian says this is the wrong analysis, but I do think that what we're doing, the big picture problem is what we're doing is we're trying to impose political philosophies which are convenient to us, not yeah. to Africa. Yeah. And that's why I wrote and tried to publish that, well, I did publish a, an article. So would you agree with me that the uh, recent democratization of Africa is not in the interest of Africa, but the capitalist institutions? Uh, it, it could be in potentially, it's, it's not de facto in principle wrong to do that it is wrong to enforce it and that's what we do we enforce our philosophies and our structures for our convenience because we assume they're right what's wrong is the fact that we are not responding to if you like an authentic african script but telling africa what their script should be and then incentivizing them to follow it with the money while well, you're still tuning to Voice of Africa Radio, it's 35 minutes after 7 o'clock. I have in the studio Elizabeth De Rock jones uh, uh, UK parliamentary candidate for Darford. And Limbid is prophesying that one day you become the foreign secretary or the... Uh, <laughs> 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 I have Mahmoud Faiz, uh, Limbid Opec and Brian also in the studio with me discussing this important issue. How can the Africans get themselves out of the chronic poverty and further deprivation of the African future? Uh, over the years, over 60 years now, world um, poor rate poverty over 700 million people are out of poverty worldwide but in China nearly uh, a million uh, out of uh, nearly 178 million people are out of poverty without aid. But why is it that Africa has been getting aid and still is worse than it was in 60 years ago, Brian? Well, I mean, one, one thing, I mean, if you take China, it's a, it's a unified political bloc. Um, Africa is not in any way a unified political bloc. Even one country is not unified. Sorry? Even, even in, in a country, country is not a unified um, place. Think of Nigeria, the different languages spoken in Nigeria. Um, China itself, though, has, has had an interest in Africa for a while, but I mean, we've seen a lot of moments now, but China financed in the early 70s a, a railway in Tanzania when it was during the old Mao Zedong period. I think China is playing a long game. I wouldn't, I can't say them as saints. I just think that their game for political influence and control of natural resources are very, very different. Certainly, 
there are there have been cases where in um, in Zambia in the in the mines where uh, China did not play a particularly uh, ethical role in terms of exploit, exploit, exploitation. Obviously, it's difficult to read it. Say it's a long, long game. Africa itself was it was a toy of the of the Western powers during the Cold War. Um, it's going to take a, a long time, but I, I I don't believe that aid itself, unless aid is actually structured in a particular way. So how do we structure it? How do you think aid can be structured to benefit the African people rather than some selfish people in administrations? It has to be transparent. It has to have a, a specific agenda. But they made it seen as a transparent thing that is coming onto the continent. But, for example, it, it has to be for a particular project, and that project has got to justify itself in, in, in particular ways. I mean, and who oversees the project that will be embarked upon by aid money? Sorry? Who will be supervising the projects that you're talking about? Well, I think initially the... the the donor and the government and private interests in the, in the in the economy. This is the case whereby a government interest is to satisfy its cronies and family. Well, that's the trouble. That, 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 so how do we supervise that, that it? Is the, is the Don't you think total cancellation of uh, aid, with exception of um, humanitarian aid, will do best for the African people? Potentially, yeah. I mean, another thing that's got to the the private sector is still very much a trophy in, in Africa. You've got to work more with people like, um, if you look at people like Dangote, who built a you know a fairly An good empire. business. There's got to be more emphasis on um, <coughs> sort of aid, but but cheaper loans, loans which are aimed at particular projects. Um, the idea of just Say the percent, certain percentage goes to aid. That's it. It's crazy. <coughs> On the other hand, there are there are development banks. There's the African Development Bank. This is Islamic Development Bank. There's the World Bank, of course. So Brian, let me ask you this: Why is it that the African countries are made to deposit their money to an international bank before uh, an international bank to? Uh, Attest the fact that they are credit worthy or they've got an asset before they can get a loan. Well, that's crazy. I mean, in many in many cases, the African banks are more credit worthy than the uh, the Western banks. <laughs> well, I'm still tuning into Voice of Africa Radio. Uh, before we change our topic this evening, a uh, little bit. The trade agreement by the World Trade Organization towards Africa, we know the colonial masters divided Africa and planned <laughs> African natural resources for export without any value being added to it in Africa. Recently, Robert Mugabe made a very wonderful policy of beneficiation, whereby if you are an investor coming into Zimbabwe, Forget taking resources, raw material away. You need to add value to it in Zimbabwe. That will create employment, uh, will help the economy. Then you can take the finished product out. He wouldn't mind. Do you think if we have credible people negotiating in World Trade Organization for certain policies towards Africa, that will be better than getting Africa always uh, feeding them with a silver well, spoon. The answer is contained in your question. I can give you an example from Nigeria itself. Nigeria has an oil refinery and it has enormous oil reserves. The oil refinery doesn't work. Collapsed. They actually have to import their own <laughs> refined oil. So they sell their oil, somebody else makes it better and usable, then they buy it back. That is how insane the situation is. What can be done about it? Well, as you've implied and I said before, what we need to have happen is something I'm not sure how to achieve. Uh, an altruistic, a selfless attitude by the West which says this is a really long game and if you want to play politics in five-year cycles, which is what we do because of the political, the electoral cy cycles in the West, then it doesn't work so well. On the other hand, as Brian said, China plays a long game. I think it was Chairman Mao who was once asked if... I think he asked if the if the dynasties uh, of China had left a legacy, 
uh, a, a good legacy, and he said, it's too early to tell. I think uh, that's not quite right, but it was something... Ask what, uh, what the view of the... his view of the French Revolution Oh, that's was. what it was, yes. It's too early to tell. That's the one. Right, so now there's hundreds of years. That's how they think. They got the patience. But in our country, it's all about May the 7th, yeah. it's all about 2020, all about 2025, and in that circumstance, very hard to see how you can get... Gen- genuinely international and I think you even to told Margaret right Thatcher that Britain economy will just collapse and the Chinese economy will grow the yeah, steel and the iron industry will grow 20 fold under Britain oh, he's, he was a genius and a prophet he did well for his people didn't he? Um, only because you weren't there. If you were there, Adam, you'd do the same thing. Well, the interesting thing about all of this is we can t- look at the heroes and look for the heroes. But Africa, Africa, our heroes died too early. Dr. Sajifo Kwame Nkrumah died very early. You never have many heroes in any continent, but we compress them as if they all happened at once. So we say Winston Churchill and uh, Napoleon, uh, good or bad. We, we, we list like 10 people, but they're across 500 years. Well, the reality here is we, we can't just wait for a hero to come along. Well, we need the African to also join in and discuss their own problem and find a solution to the problem of Africa. We have to be selfless and stop being uh, very selfish people and and looking for our own interests, but the but interests of posterity. One, one warning, if Africa got organised, then the, the West would try to suppress them. Africa's OK as long as it's disunited. It doesn't present a threat. No, it's not OK. People are suffering in, on the continent of Africa, no, so no, from, they from need the, to come together. No, but from the Western point of view, that's, a, that's it's bad. That is why we hate people like Mugabe. Well, the problem is, if... Africa organized itself effectively, it would be perceived as a threat. That is why Dr. Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, the CIA helped to overthrow Dr. Kwame Nkrumah because of his views on the continent of Africa, because of his views on uh, uh, Patrice Lumumba and uh, Mobutu Sesseko during the Cold War when America was investing or giving Mobutu money just to keep their interest in our... It's, it was so cynical that there was an aircraft called the VC-10, British aircraft, which was designed to work well. Well, enough of this. No, Let's go hey, on to our second. <laughs> <It was laughs> <relevant. laughs> okay, I'll drop it in the next time. <laughs> yes, our second topic for <laughs> the <laughs> night. <laughs> One thing about that, that, I don't believe the West would... It, is that uh, united to that much of a conspiracy theory? It's, it's short-term. That seems that, yeah, yeah. So do you think it will end very soon? Sorry, which the conspiracy will end very soon for Africa to be liberated and I think all conspiracies all have have liberal governments across the globe. Yeah. The <laughs> well, uh HS two, we need to invest a lot of money into the British transport just to create employment, businesses and help the British economy. The Tory government has proposed that twenty seventeen there will be an investment in HS2 program which uh, would be we will be investing much into it just to get our trains fast train from London Houston to uh, uh, Midlands Elizabeth yes, UK um, is playing a very very good politics with it having a poster with gold bars and a ray on it saying that 70 billion is too much whereas the government is saying is 60 billion on hs2 why do you play politics with a national interest we say that hs2 is not in the national interest and that in fact it's a gross overspend i totally agree with you elizabeth I actually agree with you. Oh, I'm so grateful that you agree with uh, me. Thank the, you. And the reason I agree with you is because I I actually write professionally for the aviation sector, so I follow transport quite closely. What I find really interesting about the HS2 scheme is it is a preposterous way to make people travel quickly from one part of the country I, to another. I couldn't agree more with you, Lempert. It is a crazed megalomaniac dream cooked up guess where in the eu <laughs> uh it's i think it's, yes i think originally it, it was an idea for, from the maastricht treaty i'm sure you've heard of uh, TENT, the trans-european network transport um this has been the culmination of a variety of eu treaties the main one being maastricht 
and it's a drive to create a single European transport area with full integration of transport to include integration of roads, rail and uh, seaports so that any EU ship can dock in our country without our permission and indeed they call HS1 namely the uh, Channel Tunnel the motorway of the sea <laughs> so this is a grandiose scheme uh, I know the government has pitched the cost what did you say the cost was Adam? 16 billion well if it's a politician's figure you can treble that <laughs> so um, the Institute of Economic Affairs has fixed the HS2 figure at about 80 billion uh, it's outlandish when we have in April 2013 we had to get rid of legal aid in this country for ordinary people so ordinary people could not have access to justice easily and could, could not get subsidised legal assistance uh, we can't expand hospitals where I am canvassing now in Dartford uh, there is there's a boys grammar school but there isn't a second uh, secondary school for boys and we're having boys having to at age 11 having to take three bus but journeys Elizabeth, to school uh, the government the money has, needs to be uh, the government back has into said the country that, uh, over uh, from now till 2050 it is is going to spend over 70 billion where is it going to get the money from okay, then and, and where defend, where does the money come I from know if it's going to want to come back yes. to this but I, I i'll give you an example of how illogical this whole thing is the plans they have for cycle superhighways in london will create gridlock for the important 97% of people who don't use bicycles to get around London. So let's imagine that you get your HS2 to um, wherever it happens to be, King's Cross, say, or, or Euston, wherever it is, and then you get stuck in the traffic. Not everyone's going to use the underground. You'll lose more than the 10 minutes you save. But if the, uh, the, uh, the, the rail system is uh, fast and better, a lot of people will stop using cars and... Yeah, OK, hang on, but trains. you arrive, you arrive <coughs> in London, that's life theory, you arrive in London, you're going to get a cab to your meeting, and you get stuck because the phasing of the lighting and the superhighways for cycles, I'm not saying that it's... it's I'm say, I agree that it's necessary to make cycling safer, but at the cost of 97% of traffic, the point I'm making is... Spend 60,000 million, and I think that Elizabeth is right, it'll probably cost more than that, to save 10 minutes on a journey from Birmingham to London, and then you lose it all in central London. Here's another point. What is the big hurry? If I'm in a really big hurry to get to Edinburgh or Manchester, I'll fly, actually, because flying is an efficient way for the small number of people who really need to make those journeys quickly to do so. But it's not fashionable for people to say that. Motorcycles. Motorcycles are a great way to save time, but uh, currently government policy hasn't been very interested in that at all. Motorcycles aren't glamorous, but they will save you much more than 10 minutes on, say, a one-hour driving commute. So what we've got now is this fashion that the HS2 is a good idea. I have to, actually made a very clear proposal five, four or five years ago. I said, instead of doing that, recognise that the trains we've already got can easily achieve the travel journey times that we're looking for. All you have to do is have bypasses at some of the stations so some of the trains stop and others are non-stop. And the non-stop trains could get from here to Glasgow with current technology in the time, in less time than we're talking about HS2. It's a load, it is actually, it's rubbish, frankly. And I don't often say yep, that. It is complete rubbish, complete and utter rubbish. And it's delusional as well. It's, it's a grand EU fantasy. Um, if you look at the memo on the 17th of October 2013, the uh, EU put up an infrastructure <coughs> TENT memo, that's the Transport European Network tr uh, memo, so you can actually read it. <coughs> about what's going on and you can actually see the map and you can see from the map that the EU has, has actually included the HS2 route that's the London to Birmingham and then it goes off into a Y shape one for Manchester and one for Leeds that's all included in the map so clearly the EU have subsumed that as part of their grand scheme the EU say, says which I think is in incredible that it is expecting uh, about 1 million, pa 1 million euros from the European country itself uh, 5 million from the member states and then 20 million euros from private sector. It's absolutely ridiculous. There, no private sector is going to invest hugely in this scheme. Uh, the HS2, uh, sorry, the HS1, the Channel Tunnel, that's recently been sold, sold off for 2 billion, and that uh, was a 30 year concession to pay off Labour's debts. Obviously, Labour's debts are so huge it can't touch them, but it's sort of nibbled away at some of their debt. That was sold to Borelian, it's a consortium, it's a Canadian pension fund. So basically our RHS1 investment has go gone off now to pay Canadian pensions. Great, so we don't get the benefit. Uh, it's the, the 
this is an attempt by the EU basically uh, to have a complete transfer structure throughout uh, Europe so we can transfer freight and transfer uh, mass people from one end to the other. Also, it's an attempt, I would say, to ensure that we cannot nationalise our own rail system. So there will always be a stake from other member countries in our railway systems and there will always be a stake. They're trying to encourage yeah, b- private Before investment. I come to you to yeah. ask if that is not a good investment for Britain, if uh, other countries is. are coming in to join in there yes. uh, uh, to invest into a project in Great Britain. Mahmoud, what is your view on HS2? Do you well, think um, it's a waste of money I as mean, the we, Liberal we, Democrat, we, we uh, UK are saying? The, with, the, with the sort of wider, but we was talking earlier about long-term thinking, and that's, I think, what we have to do. Uh, recently, I was, as you know, I do property, write up on properties, write in pro- about property, and I was in debate, and it's amazing. The country changed in 20 years. Well, we couldn't change in Britain for 60, 70 years. So why is it they can do it, we can't? Why is it that China has the fastest trains now? Because it's long-term thinking. Hey, just to me, well, on the paper, look as very bad. But what it does, it has an ongoing pond effect in the economy and developing. Let me give an example. Uh, why are properties so expensive in London? Because it's near our work and it's easy to get to work. So if you had a faster train to get from, say, Luton, the property price in London would come down in fact. Two minutes. Right. Okay, okay, two okay, minutes. Okay, two minutes. Don't even right. stop in Luton. Right. Okay, okay. I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just giving you... Come on, man. Right, but the okay, government has said that yeah, yeah, some, yeah, some yeah, countries, yeah, some, yeah, some yeah, existing yeah, stations will enjoy the benefit of the HS2 because it might be stopping. Well, right. perhaps, perhaps I would encourage even more people to move to London. Well, then, then, I, then, then, I <laughs> actually, then, then I actually agree that with something we're liberal about motorbikes. I mean, I agree with him that only ninety, only three percent of people or four percent actually are cyclists, and I'm one of them. You know, so I have a vested interest in this. So, how do we encourage it? Well, we encourage it by making it safer. I need to encourage me to start cycling. I only started cycling about two years ago. Then liberal has said about motorbikes. I actually, agree with him. This is where the government is missing the trick. I think motorbikes and the bike is the way forward. Quite often, stand outside. So they should have integrate the so, uh, cycling uh, motorway, uh, so, super so highway with let, a let bike. Me just, let me just no, finish. No, what, what I'm saying is, you go and stand outside and you see two tons of metal carrying just one person. Why? Okay. Why not make biking and motorbiking safer? Move forward. <laughs> let me. Uh, right, okay. Uh, I feel very impressed that Mahmoud's holding the line which she has to hold as a Liberal Democrat because Liberal Dems <laughs> for some insane reason think that this HS2 is a good investment but let's get the facts right here the cost is unbelievably high it, for anybody who knows how to use internet on a train you can work for the extra 10 minutes folks you don't have to physically be here 10 minutes faster 1 hour instead of 1 hour 10 minutes really and as I say the bypass of the stations to have non-stop trains now solves the problems for maybe, I'm guessing, 10 billion, maybe 15 billion. I have no objection to that. But the idea of tearing up the countryside for this and here's one other point. But the government yeah. stated that because uh, it wants to reduce the traffic on the road, the freight, yeah. we know uh, lorries carry things far away from... But Adam... Yes, but Adam, the HS2, the, if you look at the animation, mm-hmm. if you read all the discussion about HS2, it doesn't mention that it's going to be carrying any freight. And it's not. Well, that is what uh, uh, I read the memo. Yeah. Uh, and one I'm sure of you're right, but, yeah. but if you look at the propaganda yeah. about it, it doesn't actually and, mention and freight. The other thing is, freight doesn't have to travel in a hurry. A ton of cornflakes <laughs> can take an extra ten minutes without getting frustrated. <laughs> this is a vanity project, and not just that. As I say, I'm, I, I'm very keen on aviation because it is the serious, practical solution when you really have to get to A, on, a to, from A to B on time. We've got over 400 airfields in this country. So, Elizabeth, uh, uh, Nigel said uh, you can use less, way less money to improve our transport system without the HS2. So He's what right. is the policy of UK, UK to improve upon the uh, our uh, tr- uh, transport system without using a 10 billion pounds. What would you do to improve the transport system? Well, I mean, we can upgrade uh, current, the current railway system, see what needs to be done. We need to get it fully costed, of course. We need to actually get money in. I think it's incredible that this government, on one hand, we've had severe austerity cuts. On the other hand, they're quite happy to spunk 
80 billion of our taxpayers' pounds. That is a long-term project. That will but even so, that's a huge amount of money. Where is, where is it coming from? And the insistence and the determination of the government to continue with this, and I take the frank view, if you want to be a bit conspiratorial, I take the frank view that this is a clear sign that we ha- that the government cannot repudiate any powers from the EU, and in fact... The role of the UK government in this scheme is simply reduced to one of the many stakeholders, one of the many people who'd be simply investing in this scheme, and it shows that how many powers we've had actually signed over to the EU, which now includes our entire transport network. I think that's that's uh, it's quite satisfying to see in a way, in a sort of bleak kind of Schadenfreude way, to see this. But I bet you'll bet my bottom dollar that the HS2 project, no matter the complaints, no matter the cost, will go ahead because it's an EU-driven. Well, Mahmoud, just I uh, just. Want to come in first of all, apologize to the listeners uh, for uh, my friend using the S word here in case there was children listening. Uh, second of all, I actually traveled in Europe and it was so easy with the train. All I do was stand at a station because I couldn't speak the language, look at the map, say that's the station, I see the train, get on it, there you go. No aeroplane, no cars, nothing. Easy thing. If they could do that in France, Italy, Germany, why can't we do it here? Why do we always have to argue and look at self-interest and look at the bigger goal? And that's to take already the we've got, we've got the underground. Our train systems are one of right. the best you, in you, Europe. And Stand the Mahmoud, other, we're all, this, you, this country is always the first. We were the first with the railway going railway. to yeah. I want to We were the first with the tube. You're holding it back. Well, I'm certainly you not holding, holding it back. No, we're not holding it back of at all. you're holding it back. No, it's all about diversion of funds. You, we want to plough money into research and development, R&D. We want to be at the very front of uh, science right. and te- so se- had you, uh, science had, when you develop when you put money to research and development what are you going to do with it if you're not going to build trains aeroplanes cars uh, bike lanes yeah, bike lanes. Those, some of those have to be used like so you cannot you, you cannot you cannot have some you cannot have you cannot have something you you cannot have something uh, develop if there's no purpose for it. Let me, let me, sorry, Emily, what, what are you going to take that? Let, you cannot Mahmoud, have that. Uh, we don't have much forward. time to... I got a passport. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so, Mahmoud, <laughs> a huge big list of ways. Why don't we have human <laughs> cannonball travel devices as well? That'd be quick. <laughs> anyway, why won't we just have pedal-powered aircraft? I mean, you can make this ridiculous list of things. It's not that I'm against people travelling from A to B, but I am against tearing up the countryside for a ridiculous amount of money to save a few minutes on a system which most people but won't already be able to some anyway. 60 establishments 60 homes have gone in for the government compensation which has now the government is paying over 54.2 billion yeah. to those who have applied for the uh, government uh, right to the, the buy scheme of the properties along the HS2 line. So they, they are happy to they are, have real, it. They are willing to do it, but I'm guessing that's because they don't think they're going to be in government after the next election to see this through. At the end of the day, I know we're running out of time, at the end of the day, I appeal to you, the listener, to look at the facts. Elizabeth rightly said there are animations. This isn't a scheme for the less wealthy. They'll stay, still, still take the slow trains and the bus. This is for the ones who can afford to fly anyway. We've got to have a uh, uh, Heathrow expansion or Gatwick expansion let's just do the one thing instead of just tearing up the countryside for no better reason than the fact that we want to look we want to look well listeners we thank you very much this evening for your time with us on Voice of Africa Radio the program Insight tonight featured Elizabeth the Rock Jones UK that Ford uh, constituency soon to be the MP for oh, UK that Ford will be fighting tooth and nail for for her constituency. She will be advocating for the people of Dartford to get the best out of the lot. Uh, <laughs> Mahmoud Faiz, Liberal Democrat, Latin and Wanted Human Rights Activist. Very soon you'll be going to Africa to uh, do some aid work. Seeing as of course, why not? Interested I'd love to in go. The aid. And I've got former MP Lambert Opec also in the studio who discussed wonderfully with us this <laughs> evening on Voice of Africa Radio. Brian Staggis. Uh, uh, world Managing Editor, World Economist also joined us. Thank you very much for your time with us on Voice of Africa. Stay tuned next week between 7 and 8. Thank you very much.